cosmopolitan capital of Santiago lies in the shadow of the Andes Mountains. The country's Ministry of Foreign Affairs is housed in the Palacio de la Moneda. From here, Chile rules its most remote and one of its smallest territories, Rapa Nui, Easter Island. Valparaiso, with its beautiful port, is the contact center between the metropolis and the island. 2,350 miles separate the island from the continental coast. On a fast boat, the trip takes seven days. By air, little more than ten hours. Whichever the method of transportation, one must go far into the vast expanse of the Pacific to search for a tiny, isolated island. So isolated that its ancient inhabitants called it the navel of the world. Product of three volcanoes that left it in the shape of a triangle, Easter Island has only 45 square miles, and one can travel around it in a few hours. It is occupied by little more than 1,500 inhabitants. ships and ever-increasing numbers since 1966 is a memorable event. The islanders gather early to meet the boats that carry relatives, letters and packages, new faces, news from the continent, and each arrival demands a celebration with music and dancing. The capital, the only populated area, is Ango Roa. A dirt road leading to the wharf is the town's only street. There are no pure descendants of the original inhabitants left. 
the majority of the population is Polynesian, their ancestors having come from Tahiti some three centuries ago. Many have a mixture of European and American heritage. A century ago, Catholicism was introduced on Rapa Nui. The priest of the only church is the Bavarian Capuchin, Sebastian Engelet. Father Sebastian is an excellent source of information on the history of the Easter Islands and has made a careful study of the language spoken before the arrival of the Tahitians and Europeans. Noting the words that have survived in the present-day vocabulary, he compiled a grammar and a dictionary. taken by the Spanish in 1770, already having been explored by the Dutch, the French, and the English. And, in 1888, the island came under the mandate of Chile. The population is still unified under the one flag. Much to the detriment of the soil, the island was leased for sheep raising until 1954. Agriculture does not flourish easily, but once the clumps of stone are removed, different crops can be cultivated. The sea abounds with fish that are a source of food for the islanders, both day fishing and night fishing, with torches and spears, and they're common, and probably the same methods were used by the earliest inhabitants. A group of nuns from southern Chile who have been on the island for some time have contributed to the education of the islanders and have been particularly instrumental in encouraging the local craft. his other accomplishments, Father Sebastian has identified and made an inventory of archaeological specimens, such as these fish hooks, which were used by the ancient islanders. Although there are indications that the island was populated by the ninth century, nothing is known of the origins of these first people of Rapa Nui. It is an ethnological mystery clarified only by means of conjectures, which in time prove themselves inconclusive. When the Dutch navigator Jacob Ragovin discovered the island on Easter Sunday of 1722, he found two separate ethnic groups. One was tall and muscular, with large ears, the other small and agile. They had achieved a degree of civilization as evidenced in the development of the wedge-shaped writing on wood tablets. The writing is remarkably similar 
to that of an ancient Indian culture that had disappeared several centuries prior to the arrival of man on the island. found a relatively developed agriculture and a progressive method of construction. Most important, they found the monolith. Rapa Nui has changed little since the 18th century explorers came here. Its soft hills, easily accessible, are still covered by tall, dry grass. The coasts are rugged with steep cliffs and swelling waves bat against them with vibrating force. Volcanic rocks are strewn on all sides. It looks as if the eruption had just taken place, but the lava had not yet hardened. Hundreds of monoliths are scattered all over the island. There are said to be over 700 of them, some totally uncovered, some half buried, some completely buried, some having been left only partly carved. These impressive human figures, sometimes reaching a height of 40 feet, have certain conventional and uniform characteristics the jaw and nose, very sharply defined, follow an ascending rhythm. The mouth is a simple cleft. The ears with long lobes extend a good part of the height of the head. The curiously constructed oblong-shaped foundations, sometimes found nearby the monolith, probably served as houses for the priests or guardians for the ahu. The statues known as Mohai date back to the latter half of the 17th century, approximately 1680 or later, and were carved from the porous, dark gray colored lava in the quarry of the Rano Araku, the great volcano. Sculptors executed each figure in a horizontal position. They left it adhered to the quarry by a narrow ridge on the back. When the work was finished, the ridge was broken and the statue freed. It was then moved down the mountain on its backside. Once on level ground, it was taken to the place where it would be erected alongside other statues or an altar or a hoop. Some were placed inside the crater of the volcanic quarry, facing the lake in its center. There is one Mohai that differs from the others, identified only with the monolith of the Tiwanakan culture on the Bolivian side of Lake Titicaca. And now we have the Totora plant, a species of reed from which the Indians of South America made boats originated around the same lake and is also found on Easter Island. Since the distance between the mainland and Easter Island is so great, it is most likely that the seeds were brought by human hands. Engraved on the stomach of one of the largest Mohai is a reed boat with three masts 
that again closely resembles those made by the Indians. That the voyage from South America was indeed possible was proved by the Norwegian explorer Thor Heyerdahl. On several of the Ahu bases where the statues are grouped, the masonry is identical to that seen on the walls constructed by the Incas in Machu Picchu in Peru. The stone slabs, more or less rectangular in shape, were placed in asymmetrical position and joined in perfect union. It is also possible that certain Central American tribes may have traveled into the South Pacific and remained there for a brief time, since this figure carved in volcanic stone belonged to the Weta culture of Costa Rica is so similar to a Moha. These findings seem to bear evidence that at some time in the history of the island, man from America ventured there, but did not stay. It is probable that the Asians who were even more remote, were also on Rapa Nui. The similarity to the wedge-shaped writing of India and the writing to these wood tablets was mentioned earlier. Reminiscent of the Buddhist and post-Buddhist sculptor of India are these hands with long, uniform fingers incised rather than sculpted on the stomach of a mohai. Seeds of the sandalwood tree have also been found, and this too has its origin in Asia. In fact, is almost exclusive to that area. The Tahitians were responsible for having brought a small Polynesian rat, a lizard, and a horse, which even now is the only means of transportation. Where everyone looks, there are tails and manes flying. Horses abound in such great numbers that they are almost wild. Their agility and copper color provide a contrast to the gray carbon color and static posture of the Mohai. These top knots once adorned the heads of the statues. Most have fallen or been knocked to the ground perhaps as a result of one of the eternal wars that is believed to have contributed to the extermination of the primitive population. The solid cylinders of reddish stone buried in diameter, although never more than three feet, with a height that might reach five feet. They were carved in the Puno Pau quarry, miles away from the quarry where the statues were made and apparently were put on after they had been erected. The process of erecting the statues, which was discovered recently, consisted of putting stones between the ground and the lying sculpture, building a support with the rocks and gradually raising the upper part of the monolith until it was almost perpendicular to the base, finally using a lasso or a rope to pull it into vertical position. 
If the sea surrounding the island is generally restless, it is even more so in the extreme west, where the Orango volcano is located. Interesting archaeological documents remain from an annual ceremony that took place here during the period of the tall, long-eared men. Each of the tribes selected its strongest representative to swim from the coast to the two barren islands of Motoiti and Motu Kau Kau through more than a mile of rough sea plagued with sharks. They were to find the first egg laid by the Manutaro bird and bring it back to the king. The first to return was the winner and he was conferred with the highest honor. On the cliff, one can see the dwellings of the king and his court, more than 40 in all. In spite of the fact that no mortar was used in assembling the stone slabs, this primitive architecture has withstood time remarkably well. Extraordinary petroglyphs of Arango represent the bird god, Make Make, to whom the ceremony was a tribute. In order to demonstrate the primitive method of elevating the statues, Thor Heyerdahl erected this monolith on Anakina Beach. It is not uncommon to see the young islanders here recreating Polynesian folkloric dances. Until now, the reconstruction of most importance has been the Ahu, with the seven great statues erected by William Malloy and Gonzalo Figueroa in 1966. Rising from the soil with their faces to the sea, these gigantic sculptors have an intrinsic majesty. They dwarf the spectator, both by their scale and by their expression. One day, Perhaps, at an exact moment, the sculptors abandoned their work with the quarries and disappeared. Who were they? 
Where did they come from? Were they the ethnic product of different migrations coming from diverse points? Did they meet and afterwards fight to the point of total extinction? The island and the raging sea around it give no answers to what happened or why. The mystery of Easter Island remains still unsolved.